Any questions from the floor in here, first of all, while we're waiting for those on Zoom? And please don't feel shy, as I say, everyone's questions can be related to by others, believe me. And uh, it also prevents you needing to come and talk to me at the end. <laughs> because if you come individually, that's a lot more work for me. But if you ask it here, <laughs> it's probably the same as the next person's question. So we only have, uh, how long? About 40 minutes. It's not a long time. So I'll probably try and take one from the Zoom and one from the room. Ha ha. Um, Zoom room and room room. Alternating. And if there's no questions, I guess we can all go home. Yes, Julian. And I'll just say the microphone here picks up from the whole room. So if you just speak up, you don't need to come up. Yeah, no, you can stay exactly where you are. It's a race to see whether it's someone in here or someone on Zoom gets in first. <laughs> but no, you just send anything you have as soon as you have it. I think you're all enlightened, that's why you have no more questions. But you know what the Buddha said, right? If you don't ask questions in this life? Oh, we have a question. Why, why did everybody have to be quiet? When? Um, well, after... While they were walking. Okay. While we walk. Yeah. Um, and while we were having tea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was like everybody was in, in their own enclosed little space, and I felt uncomfortable. Ah, Not yeah. terribly. But good. I confused by it. Not terribly. Yeah. Good. Good. So the question was: Can people hear that good. on the Zoom? Can, they, can you hear that? No. So the question was, why did we have to stay in silence throughout the day, basically, even in the breaks and the walking meditation, even while having tea, and that it felt as if people were in their own bubble, and it was a bit uncomfortable, not terribly uncomfortable. So that's nice, because I think we come here to stretch our comfort zone a little bit, and so the fact that you could get curious about it is a really good thing. The main reason for that is because... <coughs> Here we're trying to learn the happiness that comes from a quiet mind. And a lot of our energy is used on busyness inside the mind. Our thinking takes an enormous amount of brain power. <laughs> Even if we think they're rather inane thoughts, it actually does take a lot of energy from the mind, which you only start to realize once you get quiet. And then the thinking process re-arises and you realize, wow, you need more sleep when you think a lot. So really, it's just to try to encourage the silence to start developing inside. And as it does, you'll notice most probably that you're less inclined to speak. And when you do, it tends to reverberate afterwards in the mind. So the kind of deepening of silence across the days tends to build. And bit by bit, you might start sensing into the energy around you that it's not as cold and as isolated as it seems because you're all in silence together. Even though you're in your own little worlds, there's a togetherness with it. There's a sense of mutual support. And it can become really very beautiful after a while. But I think it's natural that we feel a bit unsure and a bit uncomfortable with it in the beginning. Because how many times in our lives are we in a silent space? Unless we're actually alone. So for me, I found it incredibly beautiful over the years, especially on retreats that are really held in silence, you know, and, and really well structured so that no one needs to communicate. I start to feel like I can relax around other people without needing to be a certain way. Sometimes words, we think they connect us, sometimes they keep us apart. Yeah. So it feels, it feels friendly yeah. to speak to people. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Can it be friendly to be quiet too? Because in a way, silence is a gift that we can offer to each other. I think once we start to appreciate the beauty of silence, we can see it as a gift. So yeah, no, thanks for the question. It's really exciting to explore that kind of, uh, yeah, that kind of field. Because it's something I think we take for granted as Buddhists on retreat, or whatever you want to call yourself. Often these retreats are held in silence and you can just take it for granted and think you know why, but... Do we really ask what the benefit and purpose is? Yeah. Thank you very much. Anything from the Zoom room? Still nothing on my screen, so I'll go for another question from the room. Yes. Um, I've read um, what I believe is known as the internal 
experience. Sorry, could you speak a bit louder? I've had what I've come to be known but told it was probably a trauma experience when I was sleeping and so I had it in my dreams. Uh-huh. I dreamed it. What happened? I have no idea. <laughs> So this um, person's asking about a tunnel experience. She was told she's had a tunnel experience. Is that right? In your dream? I've never heard of that myself. So I don't know who told you that and whether it was a spiritual teacher or a psychologist. So it's complicated because in the spiritual world we have so many different names for experiences of the mind that are quite subtle and maybe very varied. And sometimes we might think we're putting names to things that we understand, but sometimes can we really know what another person experiences? I mean, I've never heard of that, and it's certainly not from the Buddhist texts. But even terms that are from the Buddhist texts are used in different ways by different people. And I think sometimes it's very hard to, to describe what we experience. It's important in the practice not to get fixated on experiences per se, even if they're blissful or if they're scary. Um, but see rather what it yields in your life. Like, how does it inform your life? How does it inform the way you live, the way you be, relate to other people, um, your values, your, um, yeah, your ethics? Is it bringing about change in your life? And that's the most important thing. The other thing you can look at is um, what led to it. Could you, could you detect what led to it. Often if it was an experience that was kind of blissful, useful, peaceful, it was preceded by a sense of letting go, a sense of deep acceptance or like letting go of control or maybe a sense of, uh, of maybe refuge in some way. Like I can tend to, I find that a really helpful way to get into peaceful states is to Imagine I'm surrounded by people that are really inspire me or qualities that really inspire me. And there's a sense of feeling held and feeling that I can let go into that beauty, into that sense of goodness. So that can be interesting to explore. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, fix to it or, or um, ask too many questions about it, but just see if you can, if it's useful, if you feel it was a useful experience, you could perhaps bring it up at the beginning of a meditation, like we did in the last one. We brought up certain feelings, certain moods. You could bring up those moods of quiet, of bliss. You said it was blissful. And just then continue your practice and see where it goes. Yeah, I hope that helps. I can now see myself really hugely, and I can't see all the others on the, on the screen. Is that because... That's because I spotlighted you, so uh, I'll, I'll remove that. Oh, right, thanks. Because it's a bit off-putting <laughs> to talk to myself. <laughs> Unless it's necessary for the recording. Uh, okay, so the Zoomies are very quiet, so I'm just going to keep going with folks in the room. Yeah, at the back. Um, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us throughout the day. Uh, it's been really helpful. Oh, I have a question about meditation. <coughs> um, uh, in a sort of similar vein to the why are we quiet sort of question, yeah. but a different question. Um, sometimes there's sort of an implicit understanding of what you should be doing when you're <laughs> looking at the breath or kind yeah. of uh, stilling the mind. And I, I know what I do, but I'm not quite sure what other people do. Yeah. And I don't know whether... I find what I do helpful, so maybe that's good yeah. enough. But like, if yeah. there are, I don't know, it's sort of a generic. Yeah, like, yeah. Is yeah. there more to it than just yeah. watching the breath? Right, right, right. It's an interesting question. Uh, did anyone, everyone hear it, or no one heard it, or no? Um, what should we really be doing in our meditation? <laughs> the person saying that whatever they are doing is helping, but there might be other ways to do what what they're doing or do something they're not doing. Uh, <laughs> um, and is it only about watching the best or is there more to it? Is that sort of right? Um, yeah. Um, and they thank me for my wisdom, which I must say is the Buddha's wisdom. <laughs> so anything that I put in there is probably um, getting in the way. And it's the same in the meditation. We think that what we're doing is helping. Often it's a little bit of control, a little bit too much interference. So 
if what you're doing is working in the sense that it's leading to more peace, more wisdom, um, again, it's affecting your life in wholesome ways, not only yours, but the people around you as well, then it's probably uh, you're on the right track. And I have found that the more I practice, the less I need to do. Um, it's more about getting slowly conditioned through listening to the teachings, reading the suttas, talking to wise friends. And that tends to condition the mind so that an automatic process starts to happen. What I find helpful is just to start off on the right track and to really make sure I establish the three right intentions. So this um, importance on the way we're observing what arises in the mind, sort of putting, making the relationship we have with experience um, very key to the whole process. So establishing attitudes and intentions of friendliness, warmth, loving kindness, compassion, not controlling, not identifying over much with with our experience. And from there, allowing the mind to, um, to engage with the breath if it is so inclined. Or sometimes you want to be more with the body sensations because that feels more grounding. It, it feels like there's a lot to explore. Maybe you have some emotional turbulence or emotions that are arising that you just want to ground yourself in the body with um, to understand how they arise. Um, I mean, they're my main two practices, plus the very important one, loving-kindness meditation, and I teach a lot of that. And there are methods you can do, for example, dropping in phrases of loving-kindness, may I be happy, may I be content, may I be peaceful. So that's a really nice way to start the meditation too. And you'll probably find that the meditation tends to build in stillness, till the seeing, if you like, the mental eyes become stronger, the mindfulness becomes stronger and starts to undermine those hindrances to meditation. Personally, my main approach nowadays is to work on undermining those hindrances and as a result of that you start to see more deeply into the reality of things. But it's good to spend a lot of time I think, undermining those hindrances and starting to enjoy some of those peaceful states of mind. So, But on this retreat we will, um, tomorrow probably, I'll talk a bit more about anapana, breath meditation and metta meditation, at least touch on them. Um, but yeah, in a group like this there's so many different people doing probably a lot of different things. I didn't want to teach a particular technique, so, but please ask again, certainly, about any experiences or practices you're doing that would be good to get clarity around. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. People can't hear me on Zoom? Or well, you're okay now? Can you hear me? No, you say I've got a message saying you've lost contact with me on Zoom. Yeah, it's sorted. Oh, right. Okay. But I'm still not getting any questions, so maybe you're all just happily yeah. content. So anything else from uh, from here? Yes. And so you talked about working on the hindrances. But yes. what do you say the hindrances are? Is it because uh, what I experience is um, I can feel the feeling for a bit yeah. and it goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So would you say that's where the hindrance is coming in? Mm, that's a really good question. So this person's asking, what are the hindrances? And is one of the hindrances when you, for example, feel the feelings and then you and then they disappear? So could that be an example of a hindrance? Um, I think that depends whether the feeling has disappeared, because feelings do arise and pass, or whether it's the mindfulness that's been lost, like whether you've just lost the continuity of practice because you were distracted by a thought or um, dullness or tiredness or something like that. Um, the hindrances, according to the text, and this is like the Buddha likes to categorize things in certain ways because the teaching was passed down orally and so it was very helpful to have five of this, six of this. But it's, you know, it can include anything that's basically an obstacle to, to seeing clearly. Um, but the way he formulates it is uh, craving, first of all, especially for sensual pleasures or objects of any of the five senses. And that can come up mentally too, like thoughts about the uh, food or sex or anything really, going dancing or <laughs> whatever. Um, and then the second one is ill will, 
which is, these are all very subtle. They can be coarse, but they can be very refined. So the ill will might not be to a person or even overtly to yourself, but it can be a subtle kind of boredom or a kind of getting fed up with the breath or impatient, those kind of things. Um, and by the way, we all have these like much of the time. Uh, and then the third one is like, um, in the text, it's called sloth and torpor. It basically means kind of drowsiness and lethargy. So sort of physical and mental drowsiness, which most of us will probably have after Christmas and <laughs> anyway in the first day of a retreat. And then restlessness and worry, particularly remorse. So that also can be a reason for losing the sensation or losing the breath. It's because the mind's just not content enough. It's too restless. It, it wants to look somewhere else. And the last one is doubt not really knowing what you're doing, um, being confused about what's in front of you maybe, getting a little bit lost. Um, so any of those things can um, cause the mindfulness to weaken. And the Buddha says these are the obscurations of the mind. Again, it's like not a defilement as in something terrible that we, you know, that's a part of us. It's just that it's, uh, it's like a veil that makes our mindfulness kind of cloudy. So the object's not clear. Or maybe the object um, seems to be kind of in a mist, you know, it's not, it's not very obvious to you. You can kind of see the breath, but you can only see a little bit of it. Or you see a few sensations, but there are patches which are completely blank because the mindfulness is just not bright enough yet. So as these hindrances diminish, the mindfulness increases. They're sort of directly uh, opposite, if you like, and the mind brightens up on its own. But that just takes some time, yeah. Just take some time, some practice, some silence as well. The silence is really good to uh, quieten the chattering mind. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. All right, okay, we've got a couple of questions here now. So, got some questions. yep, yep. Can you see? Yes, okay. I can see lots. This is always how it goes. <laughs> there's nothing, then suddenly there's like six questions. All right, I'll go for two or three keep it fair. So could you please share some advice on how I can use Buddhist psychology and or meditation to help cope living with a chronic digestive illness? Thank you. <laughs> well, you've asked the right person. That's what I live with too, only it's not really digestive. It's kind of bacteria that have proliferated and that were completely out of whack. Um, so yeah, Buddhist psychology. This is interesting. It depends. I mean, obviously, Buddhist psychology is always helpful to every, um, to whatever we experience in life. It might not directly help diminish the disease. It depends uh, as to the cause. I studied Indian medicine before becoming, a, well, let's say, taking the ordination, um, renouncing as the householder's life. And uh, not all diseases are caused by the mind, you know, believe it or not. <laughs> the amount of times people have told me that my condition is due to stress is just incredible. And actually, often when I'm very busy, it's, it's better. And when I'm meditating peacefully, it's worse. <laughs> so try to be careful not to use Buddhist psychology to get rid of the disease, because it may be partly exacerbated by stress. It may not. The best way to use, um, to, uh, let's say, not use, but uh, apply the Buddha's teachings, I think, is by having a, a proper attitude, an attitude towards these things that, um, that is skillful and that diminishes the suffering that we add. Because some of it's painful, some of it's physically uncomfortable, but a lot of the suffering we experience is added by us. It's that I don't want it, or that it shouldn't be this way, it's not fair, I can't do what I want, I can't eat what I want, you know. Uh, it's not like this for other people. And I had a, a very bad bout of my uh, condition for the last four, for four whole months of my retreat this year. It started on day 12 of four months, and it just got worse. And at some point I thought, oh, this is terrible, I'm a Buddhist nun, this is my life, there's no hope for me, you know. And then I realized, wow, okay, so you can't sit and meditate a lot, but you can always develop kindness, develop peace, develop a wise attitude. Isn't that in every moment an opportunity to do that? So I had to really question myself, is sitting practice or is practice beyond sitting? And obviously it must be, right? Because we're not sitting on our bum most of the day. So... 
I think to recognize there are many types of practice, you know, you don't have to be like meditating all day long. Um, you don't even have to have perfect health. You can always be kind to whatever's arising in the body or mind. And real kindness means accepting the situation, you know, even embracing the situation. One of the things I always try to bring to mind when I'm suffering physically or, or mentally, emotionally, is that by really understanding this, getting to know it, um, softening around it, then I can develop much more compassion to others in a similar situation. You know, like the reason I can um, relate to you now is because I suffer something similar. And that enables me to look at different ways around it, different ways to work with it, and hopefully um, give some advice that's a little bit informed. So there's always something positive to come out of every situation. Um, and I think, yeah, sometimes the acceptance is a great strength. I mean, by the end of those four months, I had a lot more equanimity and acceptance of the condition. And sometimes still I get concerned that maybe, again, I won't be able to sit as much as I wish next rains. But, um, but every moment is a moment that I can be kind. So it's really about the qualities we develop more than anything else. I hope that helps a bit. Um, one of the things Ajahn Brahm told me quite early on in our, like after I met him around 2010, I had this chronic illness then too. And I said, oh, there's nothing I can do. I've tried everything. And he said, don't say you've tried everything. So it doesn't always mean accepting as in doing nothing. Accepting means accept the situation, but do whatever you can to try to find some solution at the same time. Recognizing that, um, you know, there's so much we control and a lot remains beyond our control. So I carried on looking. I did find a good doctor, but still, it's not cured. Yeah, um, I'll carry on with the Zoom. A couple more questions. Uh, so I mentioned looking for wiseness and integrity in friends. How do we support ourselves and our practice when our family members have different ideas about the world to us? Well, I guess we look for the wisdom and integrity in them anyway, because it's not only that our own views are wise and that our own ways of living are, you know, ideal, there are still things that our family members, that everybody around us does, that we can respect, that we can find uh, something to admire in. At the same time, the Buddha did say that ideally, to have a harmonious life, it's good to hold in common with our companions views that lead to liberation and also virtue that's unbroken and, and obviously not always unbroken, but good virtue. So these are two of the qualities that, um, that are very supportive in the spiritual path. And I'm sure you can develop friendships outside of your family who can, um, who can play those kind of parts in your life because we can't get everything through our family. We can't get everything in one person. You know, we need a variety of friends. And I guess sometimes it can be about how much time we spend around the people we're, we're close to. And if it really isn't supportive, perhaps taking more time to yourself to meditate, to practice compassion, to practice patience. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as we get, it's interesting because on the one hand, we need to be around people who have similar values and views to us. And yet on the other, the more we develop in the practice, the less that matters so much because we become a lot more confident in ourself. Um, and we don't need to kind of insist that everyone feels or thinks the same. There's a kind of inner security and assurance, um, that enables us to see other people's perspective without getting swayed. But I think maybe looking for some Dhamma friends, developing, you know, coming to these kind of retreats and groups and ongoing meditation groups if you can, that can be very helpful as well. But yeah, try to look at your family members and see the goodness in them, see something you can respect. All right, another one from here. Could you please share some advice on how I can use Oh, that's the same one. All right, good. I have an intermittently noisy neighbor. <laughs> yeah, loud music, especially from the teenage daughter when her mother's out. Oh, poor teenage. Oh, I was so loud as a teenager. My mum would turn hers down if asked. 
But the daughter usually ignores us knocking on the door and eventually turns it down, but it continues to happen. That's good. I thought you were going to say she turns it up when you knock on the door. <laughs> I find this very stressful and threatening and struggle to stop thinking about it for ages after an incident. Do you have any suggestions, please? That's really tough if it's actually stressing you out and feeling and, and sort of feeling threatening to you. Yeah. Ah, what to do here? I don't know. The mom would turn hers down if asked. So the mom also plays loud music. Hmm? I mean, perhaps you have to have a word with the mom. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm feeling a lot of compassion for the teenager too, because I know when I was a teenager, I absolutely needed it. I know it sounds re weird, but I mean, I did play really loud music for about four hours every day and sing my lungs out. And it was a kind of kind of got me through that period saying I, I guess it wasn't very fair on my parents when I think about it and we didn't have neighbours who could hear so that was fortunate uh, yeah the daughter usually ignores us I wonder if you could actually meet this daughter and just speak really kindly to her about it in a way that doesn't judge in a way that just asks her very, it sort of tells her the, the struggle and actually expresses some empathy at the same time I wonder if there's a way you could negotiate you know, timings around it, perhaps, that at certain times, I mean, you might have to involve the mom, at certain times it's okay to play it loud, and at other times, I mean, certainly after sort of 10 at night, there must be sort of neighbourhood rules, I would think, on that. Um, and the stress and the feeling of it being threatening. Yeah, I wonder, where's my video gone? No, it's okay, huh? host asked me to start my video. No, I think it's okay. Um, to have suggestions. Struggled to stop thinking about it for ages afterwards. Um, I mean, if you really can't do anything about this, I think then practicing a lot of metta would be helpful for you because that will help you deal with the emotions that are arising, the stress and the feeling of threat, threat and also the thinking about it for a long time afterwards. It, these are sort of things based on aversive reactions, which are understandable, but at the same time, it's adding stress onto it when you can't stop thinking about it for a long period of time. So the Buddha did say that for those kind of thoughts that start to become negative and destructive to your own well-being, we can use substitution. We can actually replace those thoughts with goodwill towards ourself. And I think sometimes people think metta is all about spreading it to other people. But often, you know, we need metta towards our own feelings. And metta isn't necessarily an emotion. It can be an attitude towards life. So maybe at those times you could just sit with yourself for a while, even maybe listen to a talk, put some earplugs in, listen to a Dhamma talk, try to distract yourself and, um, and give yourself some loving kindness. I don't really have any other ideas. Anyone in this room has some ideas about this? It's very difficult, isn't it? Because teenagers will be teenagers. And I mean, at least you know she'll grow up soon. <laughs> so don't move house because it'll probably be over in a year or two, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Sorry. That's... Yeah. I don't know if this really fits, but yeah. I remember I went to the guy house and the guy there was um, doing talk. There was a bloke in the room who had a really irritating cough. Yeah. Um, and outside there were lots of ravens, not ravens, um, crows. Mm. And everyone had written little questions to say, how can you manage that man with the irritating cough? Yeah. And he was saying about listen, the sounds, you know, you yeah. it's okay listening to those yeah. crows. Yeah. And actually that man might have a condition. Or, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quite as mean as picked on this poor man. Yeah. But, um, that's right. The gist was about how how you allow certain sounds mm. to make them okay and how some sounds you judge and right, right, right. treat differently. So I don't yeah. Think that's... No, that's really helpful. This lady was just saying in the room that um someone had a very irritating cough on a retreat and um they were sort of encouraged to listen to First of all, to like accept that that person might have a serious condition, so to develop a bit of compassion there, like with this teenager, maybe she's really stressed out, you know, and feeling 
quite uh, emotional, lots of hormones going on, mm. <laughs> having a bit of compassion there, but also diverting the attention to something else, like the sound of the ravens outside. And maybe ravens aren't the most melodious bird, but I think, you know, if you're feeling stressed and a, a sense of threat, then it is really helpful if you can turn to something that's soothing for you, like something that's um, a gift of compassion to yourself, you know, to deal with those emotions that are being aroused because that's something that perhaps would come up with some other trigger. In this case, it happens to be this um, loud music. But maybe there's something you can listen to, some sounds on YouTube of the nature, the birds. I don't know how loud the music is coming from next door. Um, or Dhamma talks, etc. So yeah, to just try to um, divert your mind in some way. And again, I think the words of loving kindness repeated internally inside your mind can be very, very helpful. You know, maybe words of compassion directly related to the stressful feelings. May I be kind to this stress. I understand it's hard right now. May I be kind to this. That could help. All right. I'm coming to one more from Zoom and then back to the room. Uh, Q&A sessions could always go on all day. <laughs> Christmas has been hard with feelings of rejection from family. I found Venchanda's inner child meditation helpful. It feels like this is a lesson for me. What are Venerable's thoughts? I think I would like to be an anonymous. Yes, of course. Um, what are my thoughts? Um, listen to it again, because I can't remember what my thoughts were at the time. <laughs> These happen very spontaneously. But um, yeah, the inner child, I suppose... Uh, Often we haven't been met in the ways that we would have liked to be met by our family when we were younger or by our friends, whoever, but usually it's the caregivers. And there can be all kinds of reasons for that. I mean, sometimes we misinterpret what our parents say or mean. Sometimes they just don't have the time that we need. So there's a sense of neglect, emotional neglect. Sometimes they haven't had good examples, you know, themselves of how to love, how to parent, how to listen. And so, you know, of course, everybody's human. They might not be able to uh, give you everything you need. And so there's this part of us that's still looking for that. You know, we're still looking to find it in others. We're still looking to find it in our teachers or in our friends. And, um, and sometimes instead we can almost imagine, you know, when a certain emotion comes up, we can imagine it like a little child that's coming to, to us for help. You know, like there's a part of all of us that's vulnerable or that feels rejected and I sometimes like to kind of um, anthropom anthropomorphize that feeling as though it's a little child, you know, coming all kind of bedraggled, maybe wet and cold, and it's coming into my mind. And I'm the sort of older, wiser me. <laughs> and I kind of, you know, allow it to come and embrace it and give it that love that maybe it needed at the time. Because we actually do have that love inside us. We do have those tools that we, or those um, ways of responding that we would like to uh, have been given by someone else. So, I think it's about sort of learning to give that to ourselves, um, opening the door of our heart, to coin Arjun Brahm's phrase, to those parts of us that we maybe we don't want to look at or we've rejected somehow. Um, those parts, we may even feel ashamed, right, of this inner child. But honestly, we're all just children. We're just in adult bodies, but we're just children. I mean, until we're stream winners, we're not even on the path. We're just trying to be on the path, you know? We're just kind of messing around, getting it right sometimes by chance, getting it wrong most of the time, and that's okay. So, yeah, to be very, very tender and gentle and also very patient. It's another aspect of uh, right intention. Part of the gentleness is being patient, being very loving, very caring, and more gentle than you think you need to be. So I hope that's something anyway. And just be creative. I mean, when I do these guided beds, I just kind of do what comes to mind at the time. And it's just often what I'm doing or I don't know where it comes from. So just be creative and trust the process. There's no real right or wrong. Okay. <clears throat> okay. How many more are there here? Only one more, I think. Good. <clears throat> so I'll come to the room. <coughs> and see if there's anything more here, and then try to finish the last Zoom question. Yes. So people like me, 
who are not leading a supra mundane life. No, what? Sorry. Not leading a supra mundane life. Like yes, like lot of us. Yes. With uh, greed, anxiety, negative emotion. Yeah. So, so question is personal. Uh, <clears throat> how to get over the or how to conquer uh, aham or ego? Yeah. Uh, there are moments where it kind of it start playing and it ruins everything. <laughs> yeah, it's true, isn't it? So, how do we overcome our ego okay, that can ruin everything when we're not yet enlightened, basically? And I think you know that's most of us here. We're not yet enlightened. We're all at various stages, trying to be on the path. Um, and this is really the root problem, isn't it? It's the sense of self. It's the ego. I think you've already described the first step of what to do, which is just to recognize it to identify it when these emotions come up, you know, you're recognizing, okay, greed has arisen or anger has arisen, and you're recognizing that one of the causes is the sense of self. So this is great. And you're also recognizing that it's destructive. Um, so this is actually a more powerful step than it sounds. In the Buddhist uh, text, there were all kinds of examples of uh, the monks and nuns in those days who were also human beings like ours. Um, having all kinds of inner struggles. And whenever um, these things would arise for them, they would say to themselves, Mara, I know you. Mara, I know you. Yeah. It's the negative forces of the mind, however you want to personify that. They personified it as this Mara thing. That's a kind of force of all kind of destruction and ego and all the rest. Um, just saying, I know you, Mara. In the text, it says, Mara slinks away, shoulders hunched, disappointed and sad. And he just, mm, they know me, the nun knows me, mm, knows me. <laughs> Which is a really nice little image there. So, and it also gives you a sense that this is not you. This is something that's come into the mind, but this is not actually um, you. It's a force, as you say, a destructive force that you've identified. So this is wonderful. And that much gives, you know, kind of overcomes a lot of its power. It's when we buy into it and think, oh, God, this is my problem. This is me. This is what always happens to me. Then we're kind of giving it power over us. So that's the first stage. But I think also, I mean, a lot of the time in spirituality, we have this feeling that we want to overcome things, transcend things. But again, you know, the Buddha's always saying we have to understand, first of all. So in a sense, we have to come in contact with these things to meet them. Um, and to develop compassion towards them before we can actually overcome them. So don't miss out that part. Don't miss out that emotional um, skill part in responding with more compassion and kindness. My teacher often says to me, you know, what would you do if someone else was feeling the way you do or doing what, you know, or struggling with the things you are? And of course, I usually feel like, yeah, I'd have more compassion you know, if it was someone else. So, um, yeah, see if you can recognize it as quite natural, quite um, normal at this stage of the path and uh, don't let it overpower you. Be kind and, yeah. There is a second sub-question to it. Okay, we're sort of on the cusp, so very quickly. There is a thin line between self-respect yeah. and ego. Uh huh. So my <coughs> self-respect might be someone who's the next person may see it as an ego. Mm. Uh, yeah, so there's a thin line, this person saying between self-respect and ego, what we might think is self-respect, someone else might see as ego. People are always going to judge and no one knows us really. So I think we have to accept that other people's opinions may or may not be true, not to give them too much uh, value and importance, whilst also being able to take feedback if it's... Uh, if it's helpful. Um, I think the difference between a healthy sense of self-respect and ego is self-respect tends to arise through virtue, through doing good and recognizing that um, there, are, there are effects of putting good causes in place. It's not to do with me, it's to do with, oh, because of you know a particular kind act, I feel good about myself. That's just the power of kindness. It's the power of compassion or whatever. It's nothing to do with me. Anyone who did that would feel good about themselves. Um, and not to take that for granted, you know, because the next moment you might be cruel. 
<laughs> so it's more about uh, rejoicing in the goodness of our lives, rejoicing in the good deeds we do, but not taking that as a person. It's the same way for criticism, like Ajahn Brahm and the suttas, Arana Vibhanga Sutta, it's Majjhima 139. It has this beautiful um, passage, it always says that when we're um, teaching, we teach the Dhamma not about individuals. So we don't say, these people who do this are like this. Instead we say, kindness has this result, negativity has this result, anger has this result. So we talk about the behavior, not the person. Yeah? Does that make sense? Mm. So that can then can help to break those egotistical ways of looking. Okay, but it's important not to try and, um, you know, kind of talk the ego away, if you like, like, you know, just intellectualize it, because we do have a sense of self, and it's important to notice that and be honest with when it arises. Okay, last one. Would you speak a bit more about the idea of new resolutions being a form of renunciation? This analogy is intriguing. Yeah, I don't know. I just came to mind at the time. Um, I suppose a lot of New Year's resolutions are kind of restraint, forms of restraint, aren't they? You know, I will lessen my chocolate intake. In fact, I have to stop sugar altogether, but my um, nutritionist said I can still have black chocolate. But I'm not quite there yet. I still had a piece of cake couple of days ago <laughs> so um, in that sense it's a, it can be a saying no you know saying no is always saying yes in a way as well because we say no to the things that are unhelpful unwholesome not really healthy for us um, hopefully based on wisdom rather than self-deprivation or anything like that um, and that means saying yes to something else like the health that may uh, improve because of giving up sugar or um, the self-respect or a sense of inner strength that you are able to relinquish something and not feel um, bereft. <laughs> I used to do that whenever I would sit a Vipassana course. Now I think I must have been mad, but uh, it was good at the time. I used to d give up chai for every retreat that I sat, and there were a lot of them, and the chai was delicious. But I would serve the courses afterwards, then I could have the chai. So, but <laughs> I guess it was fair, yeah. And it felt really great, you know, not to be reliant on it and just to be able to walk away and be happy with lemon water or just simple water. It's great. You feel free. You feel less dependent on things. So, uh, yeah, just some ideas. But explore that for yourself and see what kind of New, Resol New Year's resolutions might be a form of renunciation. Maybe another New Year's resolution that could be renunciation is going on more retreats. <laughs> or giving more service on retreats or coming to a monastery and uh, helping out that would be great because we need helpers in our monastery <laughs> I do see who these questions are by too so come and stay <laughs> you can all come and stay but yeah good all right I think that's enough because uh, my voice needs to renounce for a while and uh, we only have a few more sessions left but uh, the next session yeah, we're having a little break for the loo and then we're having a meditation for about half an hour and the next one will be mostly silent but we'll have a little bit of uh, guidance at the end maybe sharing metta sharing merits so do stick around even if you're on zoom because it's always quite nice towards the end and we'll also talk a bit about the project and how you can support and give a little bit of instruction for tomorrow too so you're welcome to meditate in whatever way feels right for you at this time. And just a reminder that meditation is not so much about what arises in the mind, whether it's the breath or body sensations, loving kindness, Whether it's none of those, maybe distracted thoughts or compelling emotions in the mind. The meditation happens between you and that experience. If you like the contents on the screen, it's that space between the two.
where the potential for transformation lies. You might have the mud, you might have the poo, the dung of life coming up. But the way you respond to that makes all the difference. So see if you can have that attitude of peace, of kindness, of gentleness, even of trust, simply by the power of these intentions, these beautiful dispositions of the mind. We can become an agent for change, for peace, for freedom. So from time to time during the meditation, just check how you're relating to what's in front of you. And see if you can add a little bit more kindness, acceptance and peace.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation and I'd just like to invite you once more to spend a few moments recognizing and appreciating any qualities in your own heart that you can really be grateful for. Perhaps recognizing your own inner wisdom in offering yourself the chance to be on retreat. Your generosity in giving yourself this gift of silence, of space for yourself. Or perhaps noticing any peace that's arisen in your mind. Right now or even a moment that you experienced earlier today. A sense of ease. And wishing yourself well. May I be happy and peaceful. May I be healthy, free from physical suffering. May I be safe, secure within myself. Trusting my own inner goodness. May I be at peace. Meeting each moment kindly. And sharing those good wishes with everyone in this room. May we all be happy and well. Friends on the path who we've shared the day with. Maybe you'll see them again tomorrow, maybe not. May everybody be well, be safe. supported in their journey. May they have wise friends on the path. And much peace and joy in their heart, all of us here. And allowing these good wishes to spread beyond this room to all beings everywhere. Those who we may be about to meet. Those in distant parts of the world, all beings who desire happiness 
and seek that happiness sometimes in skillful ways, sometimes in ways that cause harm. May all beings, wherever they are, human or animals, fish, insects, birds, may all beings be happy and well. May all beings be safe, have enough to eat. May all beings find peace. Noticing the effect of these wishes on your own body and mind. I'm just taking a few more breaths. Staying grounded in your body. Mindful and kind. And we can end this day by gently opening our eyes with a smile and good wishes to one another. Hope to see you soon. I ring the bell because it's tradition. You can listen to the ring. <laughs> and-